Welcome, everyone. I am Dr. Timothy Afonso. I'm the Deputy Dean for the Faculty of Law in Student Matters uh, at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. I would like to start by welcoming everyone and congratulating all of the year ones for making it to where we are today, which is welcoming you to the Faculty of Law as new incoming students. We have a packed program and the purpose of academic advising today is to really guide you through the important information for registration and other information that may be useful to you as you start your journey in the university. We have some very important speakers and I would like to start the program immediately. Our first speaker is Dr. Arif Balkan, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Law, and he will be bringing you remarks and welcoming you as year one students. Dr. Balkan. Thank you very much, Dr. Afonso. And let me join Dr. Afonso and welcome all of you today. Uh, wish you good afternoon and welcome you very warmly uh, to our proceedings this afternoon. Thank you very much for coming here, um, both our prospective students and members of staff who are here. Uh, right at the outset, let me echo um, Dr. Afonso as well and congratulate you on securing a place here at the Faculty of Law in the University of the West Indies. So as Dr. Afonso told you, my name is Arif Balkan and I'm the Dean of the Faculty, um, but just Dean for uh, an interim period. So uh, what, that, what does that mean? It, the previous Dean, uh, the term of the previous Dean ended on the 31st of July, uh, but unfortunately the new Dean or the replacement could not assume office immediately. Uh, and so because this is a crucial transition period, um, I am temporarily here until the end of October. So I will function as your Dean uh, for the next two months or so. Um, the incoming Dean is Professor Raphael Hefron, uh, who is coming from England. Um, he's at the University of, um, well, a university in England. And he's university a of Dundee. Nurse. Dundee, yes, thank you. Is that Timothy? Um, so I, um, he's, a, as I was saying, a world-renowned scholar in the field of renewable energy. And under his stewardship, I am confident that the academic program uh, will be not just in good hands, but will rise to great heights. Um, so let me reassure you and uh, uh, reassure you students that Despite these transitions and these changes that we will experience in the first few months, um, there's nothing for you to worry about. The institutional processes are well oiled. Uh, and so your program, our program will function smoothly. So there's nothing for you to worry about. Um, all of your lectures and tutorials, everything has been planned. Your lectures are in place. And so while at the management level in the faculty, there will be changes. None of it will affect you uh, in the slightest. Um, so normally, I mean, I, we would be in the Noor Hassan Ali Theater in the, on the, on the uh, St. Augustine campus, which is, uh, as you know, as you might know, is a beautiful campus, beautiful trees and greenery, and our own Noor Hassan Ali, a big, beautiful building. Um, I'd be able to look out and see all of you fresh young faces. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, in this pandemic, that, that pleasure is denied all of us. Um, but we have to make do as best as we can. And um, so in the interim, I just wanted to give you some brief, a brief overview of the program. Uh, uh, Dr. Afonso will follow with the regulations, but just some brief remarks about the program and, and our faculty. So the LLB, which you have signed up for, is a generalized one. Uh, it will introduce you to the basics of a legal education, um, the nuts and bolts in certain essential subjects. Um, so you'll be exposed to a whole new world, um, a whole new set of courses that you, um, I hope that you haven't done before. Um, so you know, the nuts and bolts in subjects like exciting subjects like criminal law and law of tort, contracts, real property, and most importantly, methodology. So um, you'll, be, you'll be exposed to new courses, not just in the substance of the law, but crucially in the methodology of the law, <clears throat> because law is its own specialized discipline. And we have our own sources. We have our own unique 
ways of researching and writing. And so um, this is what you will spend the next three years doing, gaining not just exposure and understanding of the substantive areas of, of, of a basic degree in law, but more crucially, as I said, in the methodology. Now, it's an intense program uh, in, in stark terms. Uh, a, a proportion of you, a portion of you who uh, enter in the beginning, don't make it out in the at, at the end of three years. Um, now, that's a bit negative for me to say to you on your first day. But my intent is not to scare you or to depress you or to worry you. My intent is solely to alert you, right? It's to alert you, um, to, to be aware from the very beginning that it's an intense program and that you've gotten in. It's a very competitive process. As I said in the beginning, we, all, we will all congratulate you. For, for many of you, it might be a lifelong dream to, to become a lawyer. And, and you know, while we're happy for you and, and you know, all congratulations are due to you for achieving this far, you're at, at the very beginning of this journey now. And because it's an intense program, I want, I want you to be aware of it at the very beginning so that by being aware, you can also be prepared for what is to come. So it's not to be scared. It's not to be frightened or apprehensive, though some amount of um, apprehension is good. It's a good motivator. Um, my, my main um, reason for telling you that it's an intense program is that you will guide yourself accordingly. Uh, it's not simply about just showing up for classes, not simply about attendance. Uh, it's about preparation and participation. So doing your readings in advance so that when you get to your lectures and your tutorials, you can follow better in your classes. And more importantly, when you get to your tutorials, that you can do the exercises that have been set to you. Because ultimately, the only way to learn is by doing. It's not by listening to us. It is only by doing that you will learn and learn effectively. So, and the law is not intuitive, right? So the law is not something you can figure out like math or even English. The law is, you will only learn the law by reading the law, uh, reading the sources, whether those are cases or the legislation or the textbooks, all right? So just to prepare you right at the beginning, um, it, it's going to be an exciting program. It's going to be an, an interesting program, especially if you like to learn, especially if you like doing new things. Um, this program is going to fill all of those boxes, tick all of those boxes, but it's also intense. It's a lot you have to cover over three years in just six short semesters. So I want to signal to you right at the beginning to be prepared. Now, it's not all about work either, right? So university should be a space and a time for you to grow, um, for you to expand your horizons, meet new people and enjoy yourself. This is, this is going to be an experience like no other in your life. So you're still sort of in, in, in a, a transition phase. Many of you are, have just left high school. So, you know, you are still young, you're adults, but you're young adults. Uh, but you have, a, you have this new freedom that you're going to mix with, um, you know, all of these responsibilities. So it's quite a unique transition for, for you. Um, my my, my um, advice to you, uh, I, might, I might litter this with lots of advice, you can reject everything. But my advice to you would be, you know, to make the most out of everything that you have to do. So you have to study you have to prepare, you want to get, you know, get your good grades, but at the same time, whatever is on offer, um, whatever is on offer in the context of a pandemic and then post pandemic, make sure that you, um, you know, you, you take full advantage of that as well. Okay, so the key for me, my key advice to you would be balance and consistency. So 
um, balance in terms of, you know, making sure you do the work, but also enjoying experience, enjoying these new experiences. As I said, they are integral to your development uh, in this university, in this new university scenario. Um, I've mentioned the, the pandemic a few times. Uh, and let me just say, you know, it's something that has affected all of us. Nobody in the world has escaped it. Um, its effects have been life-changing for everyone, but it has been devastating for some unfortunate people. So the many who have died, many others have suffered disastrous consequences. So while we might be tempted to complain that, you know, we're not in the beautiful Noor Hassan Ali um, Lecture Theater on the beautiful St. Augustine campus, at the same time, we have to remember that we are still here um, and we still are, all of us together are, are, are embarking on this journey. So while it's not in the format that we, that you would have wanted and that we would have wanted for you to experience the full joys of an in-person uh, learning experience, um, we, it, it's a pandemic. And so the social distancing requirements you know, force us to adopt this forum of this online format. Um, but that said, that said, um, let me reassure you that we have been doing this for several semesters now. So while there it is, it, there are the inconveniences and it's not the most appropriate forum or, or method, um, we have all the resources to make it smooth for you, to make it effective. So you will be um, and, and I suppose Dr. Fonzo will be giving you the nuts and bolts of this, but you will be given um, the, the relevant links to attend your classes and lectures. Your lecturers have been doing this now for several semesters. So everything will happen in terms of administratively and logistically, everything will happen smoothly. Um, and so again, this is not something for you to worry about. Uh, you just have to do your part, which is show up prepare and participate. Now, having said that, I know I appreciate completely that it's not always going to be easy for many of you, aside from the isolation of studying in this kind of artificial environment. Others of you might have challenges, whether it is accessing the tools or accessing the online platform or just having that quiet space because you might have siblings who are in the same you know, in school as well. What I would say to you just briefly at the outset is that we appreciate that there are challenges and that there might be challenges. Uh, I wanna urge you not to suffer in silence, right? Um, remember there are solutions for all of these problems, but these solutions can only be implemented if we are aware of them. So my um, advice to you is to, if you are experiencing any of these challenges, whether it's internet co connectivity, whether it's, um, you know, it's, it's your feelings of, you know, whatever it is operating in this environment, the isolation, whatever, you can raise that with us, with the faculty, your lecturers or the admin, uh, and, and we will do our best to see how, how we can solve or address or even mitigate any of those challenges. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, people, um, I want you to keep sight of your goal. So there are there are challenges that we all face. We as lecturers have the same the same challenges as well. Many of us don't like this format. Many of us, you know, it's it's been difficult on every side. Uh, but what we have to do is to keep sight of the fact that that or you in particular of your ultimate goal. Bear in mind, it's just a temporary. Um, it's been going on for more than a year, but, you know, it must end at some time uh, and hopefully definitely before the end of your program. I, I would just say in closing that um, once again, uh, you know, as I said in the beginning, you must be rightfully proud that you that you've earned a space in, in, in the LLB program here at St. Augustine. It's very competitive. But after today, I want you to leave aside those feelings of pride uh, and, and any feelings of self-satisfaction because you know, you, you've earned that place and congratulations, but you're at the beginning now, all right? You're at the beginning now 
And uh, like I said, it's an intense program. And, and so your task now is to, you know, is to put in the difficult work of, of, of passing the courses. It's not impossible, but it's not a, it's not a walk in the park. Um, I, I'd ask you to bear in mind as well, one last thing to bear in mind that, you know, you are in a program of tremendous privilege. So it's not just the opportunity to be here, it's all of the avenues that will be open to you as, as if, if you succeed with an LLB. Um, first of all, you get automatic admission to the Hubert Law School. Uh, people who train outside of the UE don't have that, that facility. And, and once you are a lawyer, it's a profession that opens up many avenues for you. So in, in, in our history as a faculty of law, we have produced, and this is the University of the West Indies. In the Caribbean, there are prime ministers, there are judges, including at the highest level, um, appellate judges, high court judges. Um, there are ministers of government, attorneys general, diplomats, leaders and advisors of governments. Uh, so in other words, whether you are going, whether you dream for yourself a career in, and I know many of you might, might some of you might see yourself as a future Mia Motley or a future Kamla Passad. Um, some of you might see yourself as a future Adrian Saunders or, uh, you know, as a future uh, Keith Brantley in, in, in Nevis, whatever it is, um, just know that if you, if you opt for a career in, in, in the law, in the court, or whether it's in government or industry or business or nonprofits, whatever it is, um, you are in the right place. Um, we have produced in all of those fields. And so this is the time for you to use your, to use this opportunity wisely to prepare for that ultimate goal study and develop, have that balance, as I said, and that consistency, and there's no telling what your future can be. So the last thing I wanted to see, I think I may have said I, I'm closing already, but um, forgive me, um, you'll get accustomed to me. I'll be teaching you criminal law and you'll get accustomed to me having many finalies. Um, but this is, a, this is my final. Um, so uh, this, the, the faculty of law, um, we have, I'm very proud and happy to say uh, a complement of highly trained and qualified academic and administrative staff. So your lecturers are specialized. Many of your lecturers are specialized in specific fields uh, and all of us um, have a solid grounding in law. So that's, that's why we are here. Um, aside from your full-time lecturers, you will be exposed to part-time lecturers and tutors who come from the top brass of the, of the profession. So you, have, you will have senior counsel teaching you as well as judges. You'll have consultants, you'll have former diplomats. Um, so in other words, you'll have teachers who are not just versed in, 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 the, in the substance of the law, but who can expose you to its application. So there's a lot for you to learn from. Um, the ATS staff as well, um, ably led by Mrs. Ali, um, are also here to help you. And what I will ask is for each of them to introduce themselves. So both our academic staff and administrative staff will introduce themselves briefly to you. And so I'll turn it back over to Dr. Afonso who will shepherd that process. Uh, and so in closing, I just wanna reiterate, thank you very much, all of you for coming today. Welcome again from my side. Congratulations on being here. Uh, I wish you a successful and rewarding and enjoyable time with us here at the Faculty of Law. So thank you very much. And Timothy, Dr. Afonso, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Balkad. Uh, you're right. At this point in time, we would all be in a club watching the students and they'd probably be wondering, is this what I have to do for the next three years? So at least you're comfortably at home listening to us. Um, we do have a minor change on the program because of one of the presenters who has to be away. Uh, this is Dr. Ramsaran. 
but in as much as Dr. Balkan has already said that we will introduce staff briefly, I will just uh, allow each staff member, if they want to turn on their mics and at least say hi, uh, just a brief hi, turn on their cameras if they want to, but just to let everyone know who we are. So I am the Timothy Afonso again. Uh, I saw Dr. Perro uh, in the audience. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Emma Perro. I will be teaching you law and legal systems, a very exciting, important course that will teach you about the history and development of legal systems in the region. I will be assisted by two of our past students, both first class honors students, one of whom is a practicing lawyer, one of whom will be in Hugh Wooding. So together we have a very able team to take you through this course. And when you get through with your registration, you'll see that there are already loads of materials on my e-learning. And I look forward to lecturing you all and being your tutorial leader. So I will see you all next week. Thank you, Dr. Perro. Uh, Mr. Jeremy, Senior Counsel. Good afternoon, students. Uh, I do not I... teach in the first year anymore, but hopefully by the time you get to the final year, I do company law and the derivatives from company law. That is corporate management and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jeremy. Uh, Dr. Ku, he is our Deputy Dean for Graduate Affairs. Hi, everyone. I am Justin Ku. Um, I will be leading legal methods. So you will all be seeing me next week, uh, bright and early. Um, legal methods is arguably one of the most important courses that you do because it teaches you all of the legal skills that are required to do well in your LLB and not just the LLB, but to become successful lawyers or successful at any other career that you choose. So, um, looking forward to greeting all of you next week. Um, the only thing, the only piece of advice I have for you at this point in time is clear your brain. Enjoy the last few days of non-law stuff um, because you're going to get deeply immersed into the law for the next three years at least. Um, so yes, I do look forward to seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Mr. Charles. Good afternoon, students. Um... Welcome to the Faculty of Law. I will not be seeing you this semester as I'll be teaching jurisprudence and employment law for second years and final year students respectively. Enjoy your stay at the faculty and maximize the potential. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pereira. Good afternoon, everyone. Actually, I, I usually teach mostly at the LLM and the third year students, but I will be assisting Marcus as well in some of the tutorials for Torch Law too. Thank you. Uh, we I believe we have Miss Raja, who is our librarian. We can't function without Miss Raja. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will be meeting you in the first instance as part of your legal methods research and writing course where I will be offering um, sessions on the basics of locating legal materials and the use of some specialized um, legal resources. I just need to underscore to you that as the library is currently um, closed, the emphasis is really gonna be on electronic resources until the library reopens or we um, resume our lending services. I have a link to a welcome video that I'm gonna share with you in the chat along with um, a few other useful links. I'm really looking forward to um, supporting and assisting you during your time in your program. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so next on the program is the an overview of registration issues, which I will be dealing with. Uh, I do want to just mention that the entire event is really being facilitated by a team of staff members at the Student Services uh, the division at the, the university. So I have to say thank you to them. They are the ones who are putting everything together and packaging this product for you all. So thank you, Jarrell, and your team. I'd like to start by saying that we are trying to keep with the times. In the past, we've had programs that had a lot of speakers. Uh, so therefore, we tried to pull out some of those speakers and focus only on registration. So what you'll be getting today is information relative to registration. And therefore, when I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to you in relation to regulations or information that I think could be useful to you as you embark on this registration process. The first thing I want you all to remember is the we have a faculty YouTube channel. I'm going to type it in so that everyone has access to it. This is important because we have 
information that we have put up there that you can access. I have just sent it back to channel. So Dr. Ramsana just said that she has sent the presentation to student services and it would also be on their website. So we'll just direct you all to that. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramsaran. Uh, so you, you will get ac access to the information. So I have posted in the chat, uh, the channel name for the Faculty of Law at the St. Augustine campus. And in that you will see a presentation by me on the step, seven step registration process at the university. It will guide you through each step. What we have today, are specific speakers that can address certain uh, steps that I think you all need to pay particular attention to, particular issues with gate and bursary and the new fee pay system that we have built into the system. But I will leave that up to staff members at the bursary to fully guide you all. And there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of the staff while they're presenting or at the end of their presentation so that I don't want anyone to feel that we're just giving you information and you can't engage with us. If anyone does have a question, please feel free to either type it in the chat or to put your hand up and we will field those questions as we proceed. The other issue I want us to discuss is the idea of this new systems for integrated guidance and integration. This is a directive that was forwarded to our Dean and he has asked me to make specific mention of it to you all. This is a system that allows the university to assess your interests, your personality, values and skills. There is a link which can be found on the student services website, but we will also provide you with a link via uh, from the faculty office to guide you to facilitate that uh, the completion of this particular survey. Uh, the next step is the registration process. Now, there are steps that pre preceded this particular step. We are currently in what is known as academic advising. Now, before academic advising, I'm sure all of you all would have gotten a package. You would have read through your package. You may have looked at our handbook. The faculty has a faculty handbook. This can actually be found on the faculty's web page. If you search UE St. Augustine Faculty of Law Handbook 2021, the PDF document comes up. This is a very useful document. It's not just for a new student, but it also guides you through the entire program. It tells you who, your staff, who the staff members are. It tells you what the regulations are for your program. It tells you what courses you can study, what courses you must do. It also deals with issues of failures, how you deal with registration, how you deal with the new GPA. Now, I know it's a lot of information that will be coming at you all, but the handbook is a good place to always begin your interrogation. If you have a question, more than likely, the handbook is going to have an answer. And if it is that you can't figure out the answer, please feel free to contact me as the Deputy Dean for Student Matters. Also, you can ask any lecturer uh, for guidance. Also, Mrs. Kun Kun Ali, who is our AO, can assist with any administrative issues that any of you may have. So, as Dr. Balkan said, don't feel like you're in this alone. Uh, in the virtual world, there's a tendency for us sometimes to feel as though we are very uh, or operating in a silo or in a vacuum. But I need you all to see, us, see it almost as if we are part of a team, just not physically together, but we are all here. So if we look at the, the advent of technology and what we can do with technology, there really is uh, a lot of support that you can access if you simply use, access, use your email uh, and send email out. We are very responsive and lecturers, students in higher years, the students society, the law society, we are all here to lend support to you all and bring you into the fold. Registration dates. Registration began on the 23rd of August. It will end on the 16th of September. From the 17th of September is what we refer to as late registration. And that goes until the 1st of October. So let me say that again. This is actually in our academic calendar. You can Google it, academic calendar, UE St. Augustine 2021, 2022, and all the important dates comes up. This includes registration. It includes when exams begin. It includes when teaching begins. As Dr. Bulk, as Dr. Ku said, teaching begins on the 6th of, of September. That is Monday. Now, when you get your timetable, you need to look to see what classes you have on Monday, because more than likely for the year ones, those classes will begin. 
So you will need to start almost immediately, as, doc as Dr. Ku said, your time for relaxing is pretty much over. You have to now get your mind into a place where you're ready to do work because the work is going to come. Now, what courses do you have to do? I believe in your, in your cohort, there would be direct entrance and year one students. A direct entrant is someone who does the program in a three-year program in two years. They have to be students with first degrees and with a first class honors in that degree. Those persons, uh, there probably may be a very few of those students, but those students have a much larger course load to do. For the majority of the students who are doing the typical three-year program, you must register for three compulsory law courses. It's law 1010, law and legal systems, law 1230, legal methods, research and writing, and criminal law one, which is law 1110. All of this information is already in my presentation that I posted on the YouTube channel. So anything that you may have missed, feel free to go to the YouTube channel and I will set out all of these courses there. You also have to register for two foundation courses this year. Foundation 1101, which is Caribbean civilization. I'm sure that's a course all of you have heard about from friends who may have started UB last year or years before. And found 1210, science, medicine, and technology. So these are foundation courses that we advise you to register for now, because although they are not law courses, they are compulsory courses that must be completed for you to successfully graduate with an LLD. Now the direct entrance for those persons who are doing the program in two years, in addition to those courses, you must also register for Law 2320, Public International Law 1, Law 2510, Jurisprudence, and Law 2210, Real Property 1. So these are additional courses that you need to register for. Uh, so again, all of this information is in the handbook, so I don't want you all to just feel uh, bogged down by all these course codes, just to let you all know that there are a set list of courses. So if you're speaking to friends and other faculties, and they're saying, well, they're choosing this and they think they might do that. That's not your position. You are given a set list of courses for which you must register. You don't have a choice. So you must do it and everyone, everyone's registration details will look the same as a year one semester one student. Just want to remind you all that. And please remember that you must ensure that these are the correct foundation courses that you're registering for. And, and I believe we have someone speaking about, yes, we have Dr. Sanderson Cole, who will be speaking to you about the foundation English courses. So if you have any questions about the foundation English courses, you will have someone here who will, present it, who will be presenting direct information on that. Now, there is a new process that has been built into our financial uh, components of registration. And I think this is where everyone tends to get stuck a bit. If you look at the seven step process that the university has set out, one of the steps is the application and getting approval for GATE. That is your personal uh, ability. That is individual students' right to access GATE funding from the government. The university has a parallel system known as FIPE. I'm not going to delve too much into it as the bursary staff can much better explain what it is and how it benefits you and how to use it. So I just want everyone to bear in mind that apart from selecting the courses, an important component of registration is payment of fees. And the bursary staff who will be speaking next, well, who will be speaking later in the program, they will guide you on how you are to, uh, to, to uh, obtain financial clearance to pay fees and to utilize this new feature known as fee pay. The Law Society, this is our student body. They have a faculty welcome package that they would like to provide to you. That will be provided at the end of this session to you via email. Uh, they will also be posting videos on the YouTube channel, which would guide you and help you in your registration process. Uh, so they've just asked me to ensure that you all are aware that information will be coming to, to you from them after this session. Uh, I believe Hiran Rampasad, who is our Law Society president, will also be speaking to you and he will also guide you a little bit more on what some of the information would be that they would be giving to you. Yes. 
I also, I need to mention one more thing, and that is when it comes to persons who may have done courses for which they think they are entitled to an exemption. So they think that they don't have to do these courses because they have done courses similar. There is a form on the admissions page, admissions page of the university, and it has forms, and one of the forms is exemptions. If you think that you have done a course like the foundation courses before, and you don't have to repeat it, you go and make an exemption on that exemption form in admissions, and they will process your exemption. The faculty does not process exemptions for courses in other faculties. Again, if you think you are entitled to an exemption, you are to use the exemption form on the admissions page and make the exemption there. They will process your exemption. As Deputy Dean for Student Matters, if there is any specific administrative issue that you have, you can feel free to contact me. You can also feel free to contact Mrs. Kun Kun Ali. Of course, if there's any lecturer that you know or you have a contact number for, you can reach out to them and they will forward the information or the request or the concern to us. And we will do our best to help you resolve any issues that you have. So I don't want to stay any longer. I think I've used up my time. If there are no questions and if Dr. Balkan or Dr. Ku has nothing that they would like to add, I would move on. Any questions, any additional information, Dr. Balkan or Dr. Ku that you would like to add? Um, perhaps just to confirm, um, Dr. Afonso, that um, lectures do start next week. So, um, like lectures will start next week for um, at least for criminal law. And I think I heard Dr. Perot saying, see you next week as well. Um, and just to clarify, could you just say again, Dr. Afonso, what foundation courses are required this semester? I have Caribbean Civilization found 1101 and SciMed Tech found 1210. I think it's 1103. I mean, let's sort that out and move on. Okay, fine. Um, okay. Let's move, I will, before let's the end of the session, I will get the correct dates. Yes, sure. Yeah, Thank you. And, and, yeah, okay, so that's all from me. Okay, thank you. So we will now turn over to Dr. Sanderson Cole, who is the coordinator for the English Language Foundation course requirements for law students. If Dr. Sanderson Cole is here, sorry, I have a question from Joanne Phillips. Yes, Joanne? Um, good afternoon. Um, Hi, good so afternoon. I, don't, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun, but um, I just need a question answered. Um, could a student um, begin classes without paying all the required fees, like the registration fees and stuff? So I'll leave this to the bursary to answer, but there is a period of time within which fees need to be paid. And registration, as I said, doesn't end until the 16th of September. So that therefore means it is contemplated that some students may still be in the registration process, which would include payment of fees even after the semester has begun. I don't know if that answers the question, John. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, sure. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hi, here. good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I am here representing the English Language Foundation courses. Um, we were, underwent a name change the other day, so we're the Academic Literacies um, Program. I'm happy to be here, happy to be part of your orientation. Welcome to the University of the West Indies. I have two sons actually who did law, or at least who passed through law kind of thing. And I asked them, I said, um, I have to speak to the law students tomorrow. What do you think I could tell them that would inspire them to do the foundation courses? And one of them said, mommy, they're already in law. You, they're already inspired. There's nothing you can see. And the other one said, oh, foundation, they don't want to do that. There's nothing you can see. But I'm going to go brief, OK? So the English Language Foundation courses are part of what every faculty, with the exception of MedSci and engineering, do as part of their overall university requirements. And the whole thinking behind the foundation course is to provide a kind of 
platform from which we can ensure that as university students going out into the wild world of work, you have the necessary um, skills and tools in, in language, in understanding your region, its place in the world, that kind of thing. Um, specifically, I, um, with the English language courses and for students of law, your only English language requirement is found 1103, which is argument and report writing, something you all should be very good at. Um, and that course is only offered in first semester. So like you would have heard from some other presenters, classes kind of start next week, actually next week, Monday. So if you're signing up for this course now in your first year, which is when we kind of recommend you do it, next week, Monday is the time. So in that particular course, what we look at um, are, well, there's certain skills that we want you to have, skills of working together with other people, not only in your core course, which is law, but also interacting with students from other faculties, because that's kind of what the university experience is about. So there's group work, there's individual work, so we're doing our bit to ensure that, you know, you come out of here all well-rounded and, and, and groomed in your language skills and argument and report writing. Uh, this semester, things are a little different because I think we have, we seem to have a shorter, we usually have 13 weeks, but this is beginning to look a lot like 12. It's 100% coursework because of COVID-19. So be prepared for that as well. So you're assessed by means of individual and um, group assignments. And we're basically looking at the structure of argument. It might be a little different from the kind of argument that you are doing in your core program. But if it is, I think that's a good thing because you're, you're doing law. You need to learn to argue in different contexts and in different places and with different people. So those are good skills. And of course, we emphasize a lot your language, you know, sentences, complete sentences, um, your open-mindedness, being able to look at both sides of an argument, that is also very important. And the other kind of argument that we do in report writing, because you might be wondering, how does report writing um, fit into this? And it fits into it because in the report writing, you investigate a particular problem, and then you argue for the best solution to that problem. So there's argument and we're coming at it from, from different sides. So like I said, 1103, that's the only English language requirement that you have as law students. It's offered in first semester, which is now, and the next time it will be offered is during the summer program where it's a lot shorter, a lot tighter, and a lot more intense. So my advice, do it now, right? Get all of your foundation courses out of the way as soon as possible so that you get more time to concentrate on your core interests. So that's it from me. See you next week. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sanderson Cole. I, I think I know who your, your, your children were. I think I think I, I know for a fact we taught uh, one. <laughs> so I'm not gonna call his first name, but I think we all know who the person is. I would like to know which of the answers he gave. Oh come on. How don't yeah. you know which answer he gave? I, I I really am struggling, but I think he's capable of giving both. So he said that they were already inspired. There's nothing I can see. <laughs> okay, that sounds like him. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, just, to, just to build on what Dr. Cole has said, uh, and I made a mistake again in what I typed, the foundation courses that you have to do in semester one would be found 1103, which is argument and report writing, and found 1210, which is science, medicine, and technology. So those are the two courses you're doing this semester. Argument report writing found 1103 
and found 1210 Science, Medicine and Technology. Caribbean Civ will be done in semester two. So thank you very much, Dr. Cole. I don't know if anyone has any questions for Dr. Cole. Okay, well, thank you very much. Let's move on with the program. Uh, our next presenter is Ms. Raja. Uh, wait, sorry, I'm seeing two hands. I'm seeing two hands. Christine Lee Brown. Christine, and then Jensen. Thank you for that. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, if someone did a postgraduate degree before and they completed Simon and Tech as one of their foundation courses, um, do they have to do it again or can they be exempted? And if they are exempted, um, will they have to do another course in place of that? Okay. Christine, is the question, if you have already done the foundation courses and you're applying for an exemption, do you have to do another course to make up the difference? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't. Because what you'll be applying for is something known as exemption with credit. So you'll be getting an exemption and you'll be getting credit for the exemption. So you won't oh, have to okay. do additional courses to make up for it. Um, can I just? Um, yeah, sure, so Dr. Cole. Um, pushing something there. Um, courses at the UE kind of operate in two, in two areas. There are courses that you can get exemptions from. I think that the, there used to be a rule that said that after five years, that of course had a pass mark of, or, or accuracy or rate of five years. That has been removed on all courses, I believe, except foundation courses. So I know specifically if you're looking at foundation courses, if you have done them in a degree before, and let's say time has passed, you're not going to get an exemption. So you have to be very careful about the course that you're applying for. Thank you, Dr. Cole. Uh, Jensen? Yes, thank you for the recognition. My question was actually similar to Christine's. Um, I am a direct entrance student, having just completed a degree. And so for instance, it is specific in one sense to Dr. Cole. Um, what I want to ask is, I would have completed academic English for research purposes. And for the, that course in particular, um, can I perhaps apply for an exemption for the um, English, the compulsory English course for this program? And separately, in similar um, fashion with Christine, for courses like Caribbean Civilization, SciMed and Tech and so on, um, completed those courses just about two years ago, uh, would you still have to apply for an exemption nevertheless for that or would it just be understood that you completed those courses and um, it would be passed over okay so in relation to the second question uh which is whether you need to register for them again yes because your first degree is completed with its with its credits so if you are now doing llb then you have to register for the course and you would have to apply for the credit with exemption for that course, so that this particular transcript will be complete. Does, does that answer that question? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you. And the first question where you were asking if uh, you've done one foundation course, but it's not exactly this, if you could get exempted for this, my instinctive answer is that no, it's a different foundation course. Dr. Cole can specify that the foundation courses are tailored to faculties. So having completed one foundation English course in a faculty, another faculty, I don't think it would qualify you for an exemption for this foundation course, but bear in mind, you can make an application, you can apply, and they will make the determination. But I'm saying from the faculty's position, I don't think doing a foundation English course in another faculty, which is not this course, it would meet the requirements for exemption. Dr. Cole, you have anything or Dr. Dr. Balkan? Um, the academic English for research purposes is a different course from yeah. argument and report writing different requirements, different structure, all those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. So Jensen, that would therefore mean that you would have to do this course. It's a different course. It's just because it's a foundation English course doesn't mean that they're all the same. I hope that answers the question, Jensen. 
Yeah, much appreciated. Thank okay, thank you. Rashida? Um, good afternoon, Dr. Alfonso. Hi, good good afternoon. afternoon, all. I have a specific question to ask. I'm actually not an LLB student. I've actually been recently accepted into a postgraduate diploma program in the faculty. And what I really wanted to know, because I am a new student, essentially just like the first year LLB students. But what I also wanted to know is that I understand that the faculty does not permit um, specially admitted students to read for individual courses beyond the LLB, but particularly in the case of the foundation course that is relevant to the program, would I be able to do that course individually to assist with my pursuits at the graduate level, or would I also be debarred from that course as well? I'd like to hand this over to Dr. Ku, who is actually Deputy Dean for Graduate Affairs. It is. Um, yeah, okay, great, thanks. Uh, okay, so I probably should, we should probably handle this off the air. So if you can email me directly, I'll put, I'll message you on the chat. Um, it's not necessarily the case that we outright have a ban on specially admitted students. It's just that there's a procedure to follow to get the ability to read for LLB course. Um, we can make the case for you, given that you'll be doing the, well, either the PG diploma or the LLM. Um, so we can discuss that off air, but um, there, there's a procedure which the UE has and there's a form to be filled in and there may be a fee that is also attached to that. So um, we can chat on the side rather than taking up the meeting here. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ku. And Rashida, Dr. Dalton has written that postgrad students will have their own orientation on Friday. So oh, you can also do that. Much. Much. But I still encourage you to speak with Dr. Ku and write him a message. Uh, okay, Christine, thank you. You're welcome. Christine, you have another question? Yes, thank you. Um, I just have two questions, please. The first one being, um, how can we access the exemption um, applications or the application form for us to apply for exemption? That's one and two. When will our advising polls be removed, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, I can answer these questions, but just to make it clear, I'd like to invite uh, Mrs. Kun Kun Ali, who is the AO, to answer those questions, Anita. Hi, good afternoon, students, and a warm welcome again. Uh, just to let you all know, as I've been answering in the chat, um, all advising holes will be lifted at 4 p.m. this afternoon. So once uh, you receive your advising hold, you can then proceed to register for the list of courses that I shared in the chat box as well. So at 4 p.m., there's an automatic um, removal of holes. All students can then proceed to register. Okay, and we'll chat again. Thanks, Dr. Afonso. Thank you very Anita, much. Uh, Anita, as you are, are, uh, had your camera on, uh, maybe you should introduce yourself briefly too, no? Sure, sure, that's not a problem. Welcome students, my name is Anita Ali. And I am the admin officer at the Faculty of Law, I'm part of the support team with all of the faculty members here to make your journey through the LLB program a smooth and one filled with wonderful experiences. Welcome again. Thank you. Handing you over back to Dr. Afonso. Thank you, Anita. Uh, so unless there are any more questions, uh, we can move on with the program. Our next presenter actually spoke briefly Ms. Raja, I'm not sure if she has anything else to add, but I would like to give her her five minutes slot. Um, great. So I did say, I think, um, everything that I wanted to say, but um, I'm going to just um, do a plug for library resources and library training. Uh, uh, Dr. Balkan would have mentioned that um, law is very unique and um, library I think in your previous programs and um, academic um, interactions may have been something that you may have left by the wayside, but you can't leave it by the wayside for law. Um, all of your courses will require you to, to locate books, journal articles, cases, legislation, and more. And it's not simply a situation where you will be Googling um, to find these things because law hinges on authoritative sources. So please um, take advantage of all the training um, in class and out of class, all of the resources that are available to you 
and um, keep in touch. Um, you are not alone, the librarian and the library staff are your resource persons. So if it is that you're looking for something and you can't find it, that's what we're here for. So the links that I shared with you earlier um, will be very useful and I encourage you to bookmark those links. And I do have one um, comment related to an earlier question, and that was related to um, the payment of fees. The library, um, access to the library's resources is tied to the, the banner system. So you will get access to the library's electronic resources once you've completed your registration and financial clearance processes. And given, it, given the circumstances in which we're operating, where you're heavily dependent, on electronic resources, you really um, want to make that happen as best as possible or as quickly as possible as you are able to. So that's it for me. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can put it in the chat. I'm here for the duration of the program. Thank you very much, Ms. Raja. And I, I don't think you all are going to appreciate just how powerful Ms. Raja is until you all can't find something and she can. I also want to encourage you all to build a relationship with Ms. Raja as we exist in the virtual world now. Uh, you can't just run down to the library and pull a book. Uh, and Ms. Raja can guide you to how to source certain materials, cases, articles uh, that would be useful to you all. So law is really about research and most of us would have studied where we were able to go into a library. But I want you all to not feel disadvantaged because we have Ms. Raja who can really assist you all. So don't ever feel like I can't find the material, reach out to Ms. Raja and she will help you. Thank you, Jolie. Uh, so I would like to take us now to the bursary representatives. It's normally Mrs. Gooding, but I'm not seeing her, but I am seeing Mrs. Howard. All right, so good afternoon to everyone. My name is Cora Howard. And today I'm accompanied by two of my colleagues, Ms. Lisa Ali and Mr. Stefan Solomon who would assist with the presentation and answering of questions at the end of the presentation. So we are representing today Mrs. Carolyn Gooding. She's the Senior Financial Manager for the section and she extends her apologies for not being able to be here today as she had a prior engagement. So we just wanna take the time to say welcome to all our new students on behalf of the Bougerie and to just wish you all the best for your time spent at the University of the West Indies. And we really hope that it's going to be a memorable one and one that is fulfilling and that each one of you will succeed with everything you put your, your mind and your heart to. So we'd want to take the time to share with some of our processes that have changed. Um, and it has really been enhanced to allow benefit to you, the student. And a major aspect of that is fee pay, which I will speak about later on. So financial clearance, I think we've heard the term spoken a bit during our time here. And what is financial clearance, you may ask. So financial clearance is the term used to communicate that you, the student, have met all your financial obligations to the university by submitting your registration documents, paying your fees in full, or maintaining your expected fee payments. So financial clearance grants access to all of these things that you will see here, a UE student ID card, health services unit, sporting facilities, UE parking pass, my e-learning, library services, access to my secure area, and access to examinations. So we want to introduce you to FIPI. I know the term is not new, even if you did not hear about it before, it was used earlier by Dr. Alfonso. So what is FIPE? FIPE is a new initiative designed to issue automatic financial clearance and automate the management of the payment plan process for all students at the UB St. Augustine campus via the TouchNet platform. So if you're a local student, regional or international, you could benefit from FIPE. So this initiative has been in the planning for the last three years and a team of persons have worked arduously to ensure that it works. We have tested the system and we're positive that it is robust and would allow for the benefits expected to be gained. The plan is accessed through my secure area after you have registered for your courses. So TouchNet, just a little bit of background on TouchNet. It has been used by the University of the West Indies for the past seven years 
and it is used worldwide in over 19 countries by over 17 million students. So it is robust. So just to give you a little breakdown of what the payment plans would look like under fee pay, there are two categories, one for sponsored student and the other if you're a non-sponsored student. If you're a sponsored student, which means that you're gate funded or a benefit, uh, benefiting from a scholarship, you would sign up under sponsored students. Otherwise, you self-funded, paying for your own fees, you would sign up under a non-sponsored student payment plan. So the installments, there are three installments, whether you sponsored or non-sponsored would determine the percentage that you would be expected to pay. The deadline dates remain the same. So for semester one, the first installment is during the 2nd of October, second installment, the 15th of October, and the third installment, the 15th of November. Now the first um, deadline date, 2nd of October, which is which was set up for after the registration period has closed. Um, so for a sponsored student, you would be expected to make 15% as your first installment, your second installment, 15%, and your third installment, 70%. If you're a non-sponsored student, your first installment would be 40%, with your subsequent payments being 30% and 30%. For semester two, the due dates are 1st of February, then 20th of February, then 31st of March, with the same breakdowns with sponsored being 15, 15, 70, and non-sponsored students 40, 30, 30. In the summer period, we have two installments with 50% each, whether you're sponsored, <coughs> excuse me, or non-sponsored student. I just want to draw a reference for our sponsored students, the first installment of the 15%. Um, we estimated that this would be about roughly your compulsory fees, um, which our students are expected to pay. If it is that for whatever reason, your 15% payment that is required is more than what you expect to pay because you get funded or whether you're a GRTT scholar, all we advise and that our students do is to request a refund during the semester and a refund would be um, would be done, or you could choose to allow for that overpayment to be applied against your future billings. So my colleague will speak about that a little more in detail, right, when we go on. So the modified registration process, Dr. Alfonso touched on this as well. Um, so just to share a bit, number one, get your registration information. Number two, register for your GATE e-service ID. This is for undergrad TNT nationals only. Number three, go to academic advising, then select courses online. Number five, which is important, you must enroll in FIPE to obtain financial clearance. So this is new and this is mandatory. You can't skip this step. You must ensure that you enroll because this is the only way that you would gain financial clearance. Number six would be get your UE ID smart card. Then number seven, maintain financial clearance by submitting all your registration documents and also ensuring that your required installment payments are made by the stipulated due date. Also to note for our students, an enrollment fee of $35 is spread over the installment payments. So this $35 would be incurred every time you enroll in the fee pay. So important to note, once you enroll in the fee pay payment plan, you will be granted automatic financial clearance. So once you've successfully enrolled, you've registered for your courses and you go on to enroll in the payment plan, then you would be granted financial clearance. Right. Um, the fee pay system would calculate your installments based on the balance on your account, which includes your compulsory fees, tuition fees and enrollment fee. For our sponsored students, I just want to say as well, it's important that you submit your relevant documents to us um, because only then would we be able to update your account with the, your, your status as being sponsored and 
allow for the actual amount that is due by you to be reduced and to reflect what is really expected to be paid. So if you are gate funded, you are probably 100% gate funded. When you sign in, you may see all of your tuition fees on there, but it's only after you have submitted your documents to us would we at the bursary update your student account and reduce that amount. So when you sign in again, after that has done, you would know that, okay, what is actually due by you is what you are actually expecting to pay. So right now I'll hand you over. I hope that's clear, but we will take any questions at the end of this presentation. And right now I just want to hand you over to Ms. Lisa Ali, who will take you through the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Flora. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks to the Faculty of Law for having us to be able to share this information to you and to you students, a very heartfelt welcome to you all. So I will be going through to you, with you rather, how you can maintain that financial clearance. So you would have listened to Ms. Howard previously, and she would have told you how you can gain financial clearance, which is simply by enrolling in FIPE. Now, one of the methods to maintain your financial clearance would be to pay your fees. Now, what exactly are we referring to when we say pay your fees? One of the things that we would like to remind you, although we are telling you or we are asking you to enroll in fee pay, and that system is a fully automated system that allows payments to be made via a credit card or a local debit chip card, you do have available all payment methods available. And those payment methods would be, again, using the online portal, which is through fee pay with your debit and credit card. If you prefer, you would like to go to the bank physically and pay over the counter using one of our Republic Bank deposit slips, you also have that option available. If you prefer to do the transaction right from your phone or your computer at home, you can do that online transfer as well. And for our foreign students, if you prefer to use a wire transfer, that is also available to students. So just to reiterate, any one of the payment methods are acceptable. What is important is that you send the proof of payment to us so that we can easily update your student records. Now, just as some tips or some reminders for you, paying online, you can utilize the system to set up the automatic payments. What that means is that you're basically saving your card information, your credit card or your debit card information, and you're telling the system that you would like the system to automatically take the payments out on the due dates. When that is set up, it means you as a student will not be required to go in again and pay those fees. And even if you do attempt to go in and pay the fees, there is an alert on the system that will tell you you are not allowed to pay because you would have already scheduled a payment on the system. So it's a mechanism designed to prevent you from double paying, basically. Enrolling in fee pay is important before you actually make any payments. And this is important because you must have charges on your account before the system could take your balance, your student account balance, which would be your compulsory fees and your tuition and calculate the installments on those. So you would have seen the registration steps previously. We're asking if you can follow, kindly follow the order of that. So the first thing that we're asking you to do after you've gone through this academic advising session and you have at four o'clock today, you have your academic advising hold removed. I'm not sure if somebody wanted to say something. Okay, so after your academic advising hold is removed, we're asking that you go online, select your particular courses. After you have selected your courses, then follow the fifth step, which is to enroll in fee pay. And then after that, you can make the arrangements of paying your fees and submitting your documents to us. Now, a question that is usually posed to us when students are utilizing the other payment methods, which is through the bank or wire transfer, or if they're doing online banking, we are constantly asked if you need to separate the breakdown of the payments. That is, if you need to 
specifically tell us X amount is for tuition, what is for compulsory fees, and of course the enrollment fee. The answer to that is no. It is not necessary that you break down the tuition for the fees for us. We will know what your fees are and the system will take it and apply it accordingly to the eligible charges on your account. Now, while we are telling you that the payment methods are available, all payment methods are available, just some information so that you can be aware in the event you made a payment and you haven't yet seen it posted to your student account. The first method, which is via your secure area, which is through FIPE, that goes onto your account immediately after making that payment. So it's posted one time, you can always go and review the payment. In FIPE, though, just a note as well, even though you enroll and you would have made a payment, the recalculation is set to happen every 24 hours. So you may have enrolled and made a payment and you still haven't seen your fees reduced. Don't be worried, don't panic. It's just that the system is set to calculate every 24 hours so, so that you can see it reduced the day after. If you make payments through the other methods, which is through your online transfers, or if you go over the counter, or if you're using a wire transfer, we're asking that you allow three to five business days. Why three to five business days? And that is simply because we are completely dependent on the banks sending us information for the funds being received into our accounts, as for example, the wire transfers into our Forex accounts. And only when that happens can we really allocate the payments respectively to the student accounts, all right? So just bear that in mind when you're choosing whatever method of payment is most suitable for you. Now, the second way of maintaining your financial clearance would be to submit your documents. What are the documents that you need to submit to us? Importantly, we're asking you for your fee sheet. Of course, there's a student agreement attached to the fee sheet, so I am advising you all to read the agreement. You are required to sign that fee sheet and submit it to us. If you are accessing GATE funding, you are required to submit a copy of the eGATE application for us, and you have to also include your signature. Now, there's not a designated area on that on that sheet for a signature, so anywhere is fine, top, bottom, but just make sure a signature is on that, on that document. Your scholarship or your sponsorship letter, if you are a GORT, GORTT or a regional scholar, this also includes persons who may have been awarded the National Bursary from the Government of Trinidad and Tobago. You will be presented with a letter from your scholarship officer, so we're asking that you also submit that as well for us. If you are receiving um, economic cost funding from one of your governments, we're also asking that you submit that to us. And that is important so that we can ensure the appropriate fee is billed on your student account. And then finally, your proof of payment is important for us to be able to know for sure which student account the funds are to be allocated to. So we're asking if you're making payment via online transfers, wire transfers, or over the counter, those three are more important for us to get these slips. If you pay through fee pay, which is using your credit card or your local debit chip card, it's not mandatory to submit that to us. We are going to see the payment posted on your account. Now it's a new method of having your documents submitted to us. We do have two links or two inboxes. And the first one is for all your registration documents. Now, all of these are located on the registration website. If you just go in and you Google registration 101, you're going to be presented with the seven steps. And there is a bursary website, which we will get to as well for more information. So you will be provided with the link. When you click on this link, it takes you to a page where you have to log in and pr provide certain information, such as your name, um, your email address. And that is going to allow you to uh, submit your documents there. Now, once you submit, so it's called a package. Once you submit the package and we open your package to review your documents, you are going to get an automatic email that 
tells us, tells you, sorry, that we have opened your package. So there's no need, students, to send us the same package three or four times. We will get it the first time and you will get an automatic email, all right? There is a second link, but we're asking that this link only be used for late payments. So if you were already advised of the installment due dates, so 2nd of October, 2nd, 15th of October and the 15th of November, if at those times you, due to financial circumstances, we know it happens, if you're unable to pay before that and you, have, you are submitting your payments after those installment dates, we're asking that you use that specific link. Of course, how the information is laid out on the Registration 101 website, as well as the Bizry website, is very easy for you to decipher, which is the most appropriate link to use at the given time. As I mentioned, we are asking if you can follow the naming conventions or asking if you can rename the PDF file. And just to emphasize, it is more appropriate for you to send one PDF attachment to us because what we do with these documents after reviewing it is that we upload it to your student account. So it's faster, it's easier for us to upload the documents once you submit it to us in one PDF attachment. We're asking that you rename it using your student ID number, your name, and if you can just abbreviate the faculty. So for you all, it will be FOL, Faculty of Law. So just to reiterate, while we are issuing financial clearance for the entire semester to you at the beginning when you enroll in PP, you as students have the responsibility to ensure that you maintain the financial clearance. So maintaining that financial clearance can be done in two ways. You would have to enroll in a payment plan in order to receive financial clearance. But then to maintain it, you will have to ensure that your installments are paid at the agreed um, dates that you saw, as well as submit the documents for us. If this isn't done, there will be an accounts receivable hold placed on your student record. What is an accounts not be able to attend your online classes or your tutorials or any session that is online because we know it's heavily dependent on a virtual environment right now. So we're asking students, please, it's your responsibility, it's your access to your university. So please ensure that you do follow the guidelines. Um, your library services, as was mentioned before, would be hindered. And of course, ultimately, if we do get to that point, your graduation will also be hindered. Now, some tips, um, when you are paying online via, we're asking if at all possible, if you do have access to a credit card or if you do have access to a local debit chip card, that you use this so that your accounts are updated immediately. And we're asking whenever you are sending documents to us, or even if you're communicating to us with any concerns or queries that you have, we're asking that you do use your UV email address, your official UV email address. And that way we could easily identify you. And uh, we will know that it's a legitimate student that the query is coming from. And then finally, fee pay, it's interfaces on any mobile device that you have. So from the from your smartphone, you could access it if you have a tablet, if you have a laptop, your normal computer desktop, it's easily accessible anywhere. And we're encouraging you to get familiar with how it works so that you are always updated with what is happening on your student account. Now I mentioned that there is a busy website. So this is something that has been introduced from this academic year. So you all get the opportunity to share in this with us. So the Bursary website has all information that you would need on how to receive financial clearance as well as how to maintain financial clearance. But just to spend a little bit on PP because I know you may have questions concerning it. On the business website, there is a tutorial video that I would encourage all of you to make use of because the tutorial video guides you on how you can successfully enroll in a payment plan. Now, the video is not designed to answer your questions concerning gate or scholarship or payments. It's simply designed to help you enroll in fee pay. 
any of those other questions or frequently asked questions document was prepared specifically with all of the questions that we envision that would have come out, out of this. If, of course, you do have other questions that you didn't think were answered in those in that frequently asked document, you can email us. There is a service desk area with an online form that we're asking you to contact us. So FIPE, the three main tools that you will need to get familiar with, FIPE. Um, there's also eCourier, all of the links and how-tos are provided on eCourier as well. And then finally, our service desk area where you can reach out to us if you do have any questions. Now let's talk about some fees. The compulsory fees, and I think I, I glanced a question on compulsory fees I mean, on the chat. Usually compulsory fees are billed on your student account at the beginning of the academic year. So as a new student, you are going to see compulsory fees listed for semester one. The one change that we have for this academic year is the amenities fee. It's normally, the 500 is normally payable in semester one, but for this academic year, we haven't had any decisions made for um, upcoming academic years, but for 2021, 22, you can pay the amenities fee in two tranches. So in semester one, you will see 250 as the amenities fee. And then in semester two, you are going to see 250 as the amenities fee. The other set of fees, of course, would be tuition fees. Now it's it's a broad category for you all. Um, but specific to faculty of law, it's a per credit program. So your credits are 450 TT. Now I'm just picking TT here, right? 450 TT per credit. So in order for you to determine what your fees are, when you do select your courses online and you see the amount of credits as, uh, that are assigned to each course, you just simply take that number and multiply it by 450. And that is only gonna be for your tuition fees for the semester. If you do need more information on the fees, we are asking that you refer to our fee booklet that is available online as well, or you can simply just reach out to us via service desk. We mentioned the Hall of Residence here because it is still available. The only hall, however, that is functioning at this point in time is the Joyce Gibson Innes Hall. And if you choose to stay at the hall because it's open for everyone, then there's also a payment plan available for that, but that payment plan will be solely managed by the whole of residents. Now for gates, I know a lot of you will have questions on gates and especially how it impacts with PP. So before we get into answering those questions, just to run through, there were some changes that were made to the uh, brackets of gate funding. And just to go through them briefly, and this was effective August 2020. All students are required to do a means test. So previously the means test was optional, but with effect August 2020, each student requesting gate funding or attempting to access gate funding are required to do a means test. The penalty for not doing a means test is that your application is immediately going to be clearance rejected and you will not be able to access the gate funding unless you resubmit and do the correct thing. So household income, the bracket, if you are in a household where the income is less than 10,000 per month, then you are eligible for 100% gate funding. If your income falls between 10,000 and, but it's less than 30,000 per month, then you are eligible for 75% gate funding. If it's between 30,000, but it's less than 75, then you can get 50% gate funding. And where your household income is above 75,000 per month, you will not be able to qualify for gate funding. Now, just a reminder, gate funding is on tuition only. It remains your responsibility as a student to pay your compulsory fees. And one point to mention as well, Gate funding, if you would have previously accessed a certificate program or a previous undergrad program, 
and you access gate funding for it, you are not going to be able to get gate funding again for a second program. So just bear that in mind as well, right? Now, you would have noticed that we did ask you in the registration steps to apply for your eGate ID early and to submit an eGate application. It must be done every semester, even though you may at times have year long courses. We are still asking that you submit an eGate application every semester. How it works, Gate Office will assess your performance, your academic academic performance for the academic year, and they will allow you funding or approve you for the year. But in order, but in order to be able to actually receive the funding, you have to submit an eGate application every semester. So as I mentioned, you are required to receive that eGate identification number. Now that number is basically the method in which you log in to the Gate eService website. That number remains with you throughout the duration of your program. So just keep it safe and the password as well. If you do have any concerns about it, we are encouraging you to visit the GATE website. Or if you do have questions and you would like to speak to a representative, you can call 800-GATE for more information on how you can obtain your eGATE ID number. So before we end though, I wanna just go through something with GATE and how it relates to fee pay, because I know it's a question that is gonna come. Although you are accessing gate funding, I wanna reiterate that gate funding is between the student and the gate office. The university is just a third party where we receive the funds and apply it on your account. So for students who are accessing gate funding, yes, you will be considered a sponsored student, for students who you may have an idea what percentage of funding you are getting, and you may say that you're getting 100%, the fact remains the bursary cannot process an application for you unless the application has been approved and unless your means rate has been confirmed. So two things can happen. Your eGate application can simply say approved, which you will receive an email from the gate office on, but we are asking that you also ensure that your means rate is confirmed. As I mentioned before, the responsibility is on you, the student, to follow up with the gate office. It's not the faculty's responsibility, nor is it the business responsibility to ensure that your applications are approved and processed on time. So once you submit your documents to us and we can process your information, your application, the payments will be applied to your student account. And then of course that means FIPE will recalculate automatically and it would reduce and it will just go to whatever you are supposed to pay if it is you're paying 25, 50, or if you're just simply required to pay 100% fees. All right, so it's that. Well, one other thing on GATE, and it's something important for faculty of law to remember. Your program carries 93 credits in total. In order to finish your program, it's 93 credits. GATE has only agreed to fund 90 credits. So that means as a student, you will have to ensure that these three credits are paid for, but that will only be done when you get to your final year. It's not something that you're gonna have to do from year one or year two. It's only when you reach into your final year or your final semester into the program, all right? So that brings us to an end and I don't know if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ali. I'm pretty sure that you're gonna get some questions. Uh, so I see Christine has her hand up. Yes, Christine? The hands are going up, Ms. Ali. So yeah, Christine, you can go first, then Chelsea, then Joanne. Thank you so much. Um, so I emailed the bursary a couple of months back or about two months back and I asked a question whether or not students with first degrees, because I recently graduated from UWE last academic year. So I asked if students with first degrees have to pay the compulsory fees of fifteen hundred or eight forty five. And the customer service rep told me we have to pay eight forty five. But someone else is telling me I have to pay 1500 as I'm coming back as a new student into a new program. So can you clarify that, please? Sure. So just to confirm, the program that you did before, was it a different program that you were enrolled in? 
Yes. And this is with UE? Yes. All right. So if you're coming back, and you're, I'm guessing, of course, you're coming back into faculty of law, the fees that we will ask you to pay as compulsory fees, now the question and the ID, if you do have your smart card, your smart ID card from your previous program, then it's not necessary that you pay for it again. With your caution money, if you did pay it in your previous program, you can have that caution money applied to this current program, but the steps to follow is that we will ask you to complete a caution money refund form. It is on our website, the Bursary's website as well, for ease of reference. Fill out that form and submit it to us along with your other registration documents. The reason why we're asking to submit that caution form is because we need to ensure that you didn't damage anything previous program or borrowed any books and didn't return it all right so it's just a it's just for us to know that your 500 dollars is still intact when you do register you are going to see the id card and the caution showing up on your fee sheet but don't don't panic it's just that the system will not recognize your status so it's not going to recognize that you did a program before nor is it going to recognize that you have those things already so it is going to come up but you could just simply send us the information and when we receive your documents, when we receive it, then we will make the necessary adjustments on your account. No problem. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Miss Ali, there's a, chat, there, there's a question in the chat too. Uh, to mm -hmm. whom do they send the signed fee assessment invoice is one question. All right, so Miss Howard sent the link on the chat, the e courier link. So it's a, okay. it's no longer an email address. It's now a, a website that you upload the documents. So we're asking if you can send all your documents, not in pieces. So don't send the fee sheets and then the gate form and then your proof of payment, right? Send everything together via that upload link. Okay, thank you. Chelsea Perez, Chelsea, you can ask your question. Hi, good day. So I recently completed um my first in criminology and criminal justice and um transferring to the law department but i was told that i had to reimburse gate for the first year that i did in our previous program before they can fund me for this new law program and when i contacted gate they told me because they pulled up my name in the system and they said they had not paid you any money for the year that i completed as yet so they said i would have to reimburse you directly so I just want to know what is the whole procedure for that and what account I have to pay the money to. All right. So yes, if so, just as um, so that everybody here could be aware. Although you do see a gate payment reflected on your student account, the university will not receive the funds perhaps until two years later. So even though you would have seen the gate payment reflected on your student account, it is it is um, something, it is correct for the gate office to let you know that they haven't sent funds to us just yet. So you will be required to reimburse St. Augustine campus before you are allowed to access gate funding. And you can use any one of the payment methods that we spoke about if you want to go through online to do it, if you want to pay via online transfer or student deposit slip but you will be required to send that document to us so that we can make a note of it and we will update your accounts accordingly and notify the gate office as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ali. Joanne? Hi, good afternoon. Um, I have several questions, but I'm going to ask this one first. Um, the registration process is going on right now. Um, is there a link or something you go on to register? Um, that's number one. The registration fee of 14 something, is it built into the total payment for the year or the semester? Because when I read the handbook, it's telling me like 13,000 something for the year. Is that indeed true and correct? Is that the figure? Or as you said, we have to choose the courses and then multiply the credits by the 450. Right? That's my first question. Right. So just correct me if I didn't get your questions correct, right? So the compulsory fees, it is billed on, let me start with the first question you asked, where you can go to register. When your academic advising hold is removed from your account, you can access your student portal. If you aren't shown how to access it, you can um, just Google registration 101 UE and it gives you the seven steps that you can follow. And there are also um, links or information tutorials uh, via PDF document if you need 
further information on how you can go about choosing your courses. Of course, the faculty of law would have advised you guys what courses you needed to register for, right? So you just need to follow their guidance. Um, mm -hmm. And in that same registration roadmap, you will get familiar with it as you go on, but in that same registration roadmap, it gives you these steps. So the first step is that you select your courses. The second step is that you'll be required to print your fee sheet. The third step is enroll in PP and then fee pay, and then finally gain financial, check for your financial clearance. So that's how you can go about accessing your portal, all right? The question with your compulsory fees, um, it was compulsory fees or tuition. Just remind me of your second question, please, sorry. The first one was the compulsory fees of the 14 something, 1465, mm -hmm. I believe, yes. Right, so the 1465 is payable for the academic year. Now your compulsory fees, even though it's billed in semester one, it covers you for the academic year. So you're not gonna be paying compulsory fees again for semester two. One thing to note this year, as I mentioned, the student amenities fee, it is split into two tranches. So you will only see 250 billed on your fee sheet for this semester for the amenities. And then when you do register again in second semester, you're gonna see another 250 being um, pulled into your record. I answered you everything or I still have something. Um, the, so you're saying that, that payment, as stated before, um, along with your first payment, is due on the 2nd of, of October. All right. So the compulsory fees, we broke it down just so that you have an idea of what you're paying for, right? But when uh -huh. you register, what fee pay is going to do is going to take the entire balance on your account. So it's going to take the total tuition that is shown on your account. It's also going to take the total compulsory fees that is shown for the semester, combine those two, and then calculate the three installments. So whatever figure you see as your first installment, that would include both compulsory fees, tuition fees, and then there is a $35 enrollment fee as well. So it's going to incorporate all three. So I'm asking again, that figure stated in the faculty handbook as the tuition for the year is mm -hmm. not a true and correct figure. As a guide, so remember anything that's placed, especially in our fee booklets, because uh, we will take responsibility for that as a bursary because we assign the fees. It is a guide for you, these students, so that you can plan financially. But what it's dependent on is whether you're accessing any sort of funding as well as only when you register for your courses, then you will know for the semester what exactly is your, course, your, your fee for that particular semester. So it's not an incorrect figure, it's just a figure used as a guide so that it can help you with your financial planning. And my last question for this part, um, where I'm employed, they have an, uh, like a payment, like they give us a one-time payment, but they are asking for an invoice for that specific amount. Do you all like take like something like a promise to pay? Is that what right. No. So what will happen now? I'm not sure what your organization's procedure is, but what mm -hmm. usually happens if the fee sheet after you register is not sufficient for your organization, you can request something called a fees payable letter. Of course, you'll have to request that information through service desk. Um, mm -hmm. So you can just go on the bursary's website and the categories are there. So you're just going to select request for a letter. Okay. What you will need to provide for us though is the information. Who is the person in your organization that we have to address it to and give us the address. So we can prepare that letter for you. If it is your organization wants to send the, the funds directly to the university, we can provide that information. But if it is that they're paying it to you, then it remains your responsibility to ensure your installments are paid. All right, thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, all, the, the program is supposed to finish at three. So I, I'm just asking if, if persons have questions that are specific to them, maybe the help desk could be useful, but I'll, I'll probably allow questions until uh, the service desk. So uh, if there, uh, maybe another, another two questions. Crystal? Hi, good afternoon. My question is also to bursary, right? Um, just to confirm, on that is if to register for the student payment plans, is that a separate registration from that of the fee payment um, thing that have been installed, implemented? 
do I have to pay, do I have to um, register for the student payment plan separate? All right, so fee pay, it does two things. So just let me clarify that. And enrollment in fee pay is mandatory. So one of the things, more important things that it does, it issues the financial clearance on your account. So yes, you are required to enroll in PP. The second thing that it does is automate your payment plan. So it's not to so access in a payment plan is not something that you do separately. It's one and the same thing. So as soon as you enroll in PP, it issues financial clearance and it, autos, it automates the payment plan for you so that you can get your payment schedule. Okay, thank you. And my last question is... Um... Uh, in the case, because for me, I've done a first degree, right? So mm -hmm. in the case that I have an exemption from two foundation courses, right? We were told earlier that we still have to register for the course, right? And if mm -hmm. I'm also doing the student payment plan, I'm not sure how long that exemption will take to, you know, to get feedback on right so what will happen with the funds will it be transferred over to will it remain on the student accounts to go over to another course or something like that yeah so even if it turns out that you have to pay for it because your your account wasn't updated to reflect the exemption the overpayment on your account will automatically roll forward to the second semester so you can always just pay that amount less for next semester if it turns out to be the case, right? Okay, thank you. And one more thing quickly. I saw that um, in the first installment is 40%, right? Is that that 40% includes the tuition and the compulsory fee? Yeah, so bear in mind the 40% that you're referring to is for non-sponsored, right? So, yeah. um. That will be, yes, all, both plans are designed to function the same way. So it is going to pull both tuition and compulsory fee into all of the installments. Thank you. Okay, y'all, I'm seeing many hands go up. Um, I think that I, I don't want to put Miss Ali. She, she was very gracious to field some questions, but I think she's been now been speaking for about 30 minutes, um, and I, maybe even more. So anyone who has specific questions, and I'm seeing the hands, I don't mean to just tell you we're not addressing it. There is a service desk link. So the questions that you have, you can post there and members of staff will be able to give you specific advice on the specific personal issues that some of you um, are raising. So I, I, I'm just saying, Ms. Howard has just put the, the link again. So you can click on the link and members of staff in the bursary will assist you with any of the questions that you have on this. Uh, so, Ms. Ms. Ali, I really have to say thank you to you and your team for coming uh, and, and doing as much as you, you've done. I, I, I do appreciate the faculty appreciates it. Okay. So, next on our schedule on our program was Ms. Christy Smith. Welcome, <laughs> Christy Smith. Sorry. Yes. yes. Uh, so, yes, the, the floor is over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fonson. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And of course, a special thank you to the Faculty of Law for always including the Division of Student Services and Development in their orientation for students. So I just wanna say on behalf of the Director of the DSSD, a hearty, hearty welcome to you all. And uh, I'll just jump straight into it and take you through our presentation. Okay, so this is the Division of Student Services and Development. And we are your strategic partners in learning, development, and success. Our role here on the campus is to provide you with that non-academic type support uh, to really ensure that you have a holistic experience and that that said experience is taken with you as you move through your life. And so to facilitate this, we have made a promise to you. And this is essentially what we're saying. We are here to support your well-being, to help you achieve your personal and professional goals while at university and to partner with you in creating a fully integrated holistic educational experience across the student life cycle. So that is from orientation, which we're actually in the midst of now, straight to graduation. So we're looking forward to see you retained during the years and we're here to help you do that through our eight departments that work together to ensure success. So let me just tell you a little more about our departments. We have the office of the director and our director is Dr. Deirdre Charles. Uh, she has her full complement, her team, and they work on special projects 
Uh, they help to guide the departments within the division. And uh, I'm sure you would have heard from Dr. Charles on a different forum, but uh, we look forward, of course, to welcoming you face to face as you visit us on the first floor of the Lloyd Braffitt building sometime in the near future. Let me just move right into our second um, department, the Counseling and Psychological Services Department. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly. And then we have the Guild Administrative Office, the Student Activities, Facilities and Commuting Students Department, Careers, Co-Curricular -Cur Co and Community Engagement Department. I sit in the Financial Advisory Services Department. We also have the Student Accommodations Department and the Student Life and Development Department. So that's quite a lot. But you have, you know, this first semester to get acquainted with us, you would see information coming um, about our services via the marketing and communications emails, and we may also send it to you directly, or you may check us out on uh, any of the social media platforms under the Division of Student Services and Development. So as we move through, um, this is just to give you a snapshot of what we do as a division. The Office of the Director is responsible for those orientation and transition programs, the first year experience programs. And I hope a lot of you signed up for some of the initiatives embedded in those programs. Um, and of course, they are deeply engaged in campus involvement. We also have um, the co-curriculars, career and communi community engagement department, and they are responsible for providing uh, some academic uh, support, service learning, community engagement, um, careers and counseling, professional development, student employment and volunteerism programs and co-curricular programs. We have our counseling and psychological services. And I want to just stress to you, um, a lot of people, you know, they, they, they are a little timid when seeking out this type of advice. We all need to be debriefed at some point. Um, so please feel free to use our counseling and psychological services that's available through um, the online facility now that we're working remotely. And uh, it's highly, highly confidential. We also have our on and off campus um, student accommodation office. And currently, and I know Ms. Ali would have referred to it just now, we have two halls of residence open right now, and that's the Sir Arthur Lewis Hall and the Joyce Innes Hall at Mount Hope. Uh, for those of you who are coming on hall, we really look forward to welcoming you. And of course, we ask you to please subscribe by the rules of the facility. In addition to that, we have the Student Life and Development Department, and they are responsible for supporting regional and international students. They help with your immigration documentation. They also provide academic support. So for some of you who may have a challenge with a particular course, they, you, they work with you, put a tutor with you to help guide you through the process to enable um, some semblance of success at the end of your semester by working with you throughout the semester. And they do support as well students who are differently abled. Uh, they have many, many facilities in place. We are an all-inclusive campus. And so I'm always happy to say that um, we support all our students. Uh, in, in addition to this, we, this, they provide support for not only the undergraduate students, but also our postgraduate students. We also have our Guild Administrative Office, and they work very closely with your Guild of Students executive to ensure that the function and the governance in those offices are maintained and uh, to ensure accountability and transparency. We also have our student uh, activity center and commuting students. They work with students who are on and off campus and provide a variety of programs for said students. And finally, I'll just, just touch on my department a bit, which is the financial advisory services department. And this department provides financial aid for students who may be experiencing challenges through three programs, the hardship grant, the COVID aid fund, which is donated by your guild, as well as the adopt a student program donated funds donated by members of the campus community that offers a stipend to students uh, every semester based on their, whether, when they are eligible. And uh, also scholarships and bursaries. And for you students, your incoming students, I, I'm happy to report that as of today, our scholarships and bursaries application has opened. So you have between today and the 30th of September to get that application in for a non-tuition based award, which simply means 
that you can use the funds to do whatever you wish and you may or may not use it towards your tuition fees. So it's gonna help you with that fee, fee payment plan, the fee pay. Um, once you uh, sign up and you're eligible, you have the opportunity to gain access to some funding. All right, so more or less, this is what we want for you as the aid departments move forward. We want you to attain a positive and enriching university experience to develop holistically and maximize your full potential, to achieve your personal and professional goals, and to learn, explore, and feel empowered to become the best you that you can be. All right, and uh, in your first year, this is some of the uh, tips that we have for you. Meet new people. Now I know we're online, but you know how to move around. You know how to get through social media, in your classes, you can utilize the chat from time to time to just introduce yourself and share. Um, build your community, build a community spirit. Set your first year goals. You have an opportunity now to uh, get a clean slate, so to speak. Set your goals and work towards them. Create a healthy work-life balance. Take some time in between to do your exercise, to pause and uh, to refresh your mind and to really energize yourself so that when you come onto the online platform, you're ready to go. Uh, connect with your guild. That's very, very important. Your guild is your voice. They speak on your behalf. So we urge you to connect with them. And of course, number five, embrace your campus life experience. I know you're having a different experience right now, but in time, but for now, make the best of it. If some of you would like to connect with us, here are some of the ways you can do so. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash uwi.dssd. We are also on Instagram at dssd underscore uwisda. You can find us on uh, the webpage sta.uwi.edu backslash dssd backslash. And so when you go there, you will see all our departments, all the programs we have to offer, uh, so we really would look forward to hearing from you. And of course, uh, if you need to get in touch with us via email, student services and development at sta.uwi.edu. So this brings to an end my presentation. I want to thank you for your attention. And once again, on behalf of the Division of Student Service and Services and Development, I just want to welcome you to our UWI campus. Thank you and stay safe. I'll stick around a little bit, uh, Dr. Alfonso, for questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith, and for always making yourself available to be with us whenever we ask. No problem. So if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to, to write it in the chat so we can go ahead with the program. There's also a survey that has been posted by Ms. Diaram in the chat. I believe there may be some technical issues, but please monitor the chat. You will see the link for the survey, which will be a survey on... Uh, your feedback on this particular program today. I would like to now move to, and of course, if anyone has any questions for Ms. Smith, please feel free to write them in the chat and she can field the questions there. Uh, we, our next presenter is Mr. Hiran Rampasad. He has five minutes to present and talk about the Law Society and the great work that they do and what are some of his upcoming events. Five minutes, Mr. Rampasad. Hi, Dr. Afonso. Good afternoon, yes, everybody. Yes. Good afternoon, students. I apologize for the, um, the loud sounds behind me. The rain has started to fall. Um, so I come to you today on behalf of the Law Society. Uh, my name is Hiran Arishan Pasar, as Dr. Afonso would have introduced me. And my role is twofold. I serve as the president of the Law Society, which is our body responsible for all student issues and whatever student events that we may have. Secondly, I serve as the Faculty of Law Representative on the Guild of Students. What this means is really that I am allowed, and we, as a law society, are allowed to advocate on your behalf and engage your law students. So I have with me today some of my colleagues, Miss um, Alexandra Ghani, Ms. Aniko Suku, Mr. Kazim Flery, Ms. Ariana Ramnarain, all of whom are going to talk about, in a very, very brief manner, I assure you, uh, what the schedule is going to look like for the next coming weeks as we try to welcome you and integrate you into year one of the LLB. As I depart and I hand you over to Ms. Ghani, I wish to impress on you two things. One, be adaptable to the demands of the degree. 
the LLB is going to challenge you in a way that you've never been tested before. Allow me to say, and I'm sure it's with the approval of any of my lecturers, the study of the law is unlike anything that you would have done before. It requires its own tactic. It, it is its own art. So as you embark on this journey, remember that it's just that, a journey where you get to find ultimately how best to study the law and how to make it your passion. And the last thought that I leave with you guys today as the president, and do trust me, you'll be hearing a lot more from me as our events go on, is to take a look at the names on this Zoom chat. Take a look at these names and remember that these are the people who, with whom you are going to shape the legal world. So with that in mind, give yourselves to the activities that we have planned. We have a terrific, terrific slate of, the, uh, of uh, Law Society executive members, and we have so many events, but I don't want to take away from the thunder of my committee chairs. So let me pass you on now to our Education and Moot Committee Chairperson. Her role does exactly just that. She's in charge of supporting your educational development. So I, I pass you on now to Ms. Ghani to give you an idea of what we can expect for our House of Law Initiative. So it's been a great pleasure, and I look forward to hearing from you guys. Over to you, Alex. Um, hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Alexandra Ghani. As Iran would have indicated, I am your Education and Mood Committee chairperson. Uh, if you plan to participate in any of the Law Society events, such as the mock trial, joining the Mood Club, Faculty Feud, the database scavenger hunt that I'm going to be putting on this year, you'll be seeing a lot of me. Um, so first and foremost, congratulations on getting into law. It's a huge honor and privilege to be able to study this field. I know how excited you all must be. Um, it is without a doubt that you have probably been told several times that you are the cream of the crop. You um, you should be proud of your achievements and, you know, you're 100, 150 people, give or take, um, picked out of thousands of applicants. And that is true. You should be proud, rightfully so. Um, however, that's not a guarantee that you're going to do well in this degree, uh, not to dampen your spirits or anything. Um, and I know some of you are probably saying, oh, well, I got several distinctions both years. Uh, she can't be talking about me. I also got distinctions. And my distinctions were in Cape Law. I still struggled. Um, this degree is unlike anything you would have done before, whether or not you've studied criminology on open campus or you've done Cape Law or you've done uh, you know, anything else. I promise you, it's not going to prepare you for what this degree is going to um, put you through. So how do you prepare? Uh, and that's where I come in. I am start, I have, I'm currently running a how to law initiative where I undertake um, a two part process to help you all adapt because one of the toughest things that our students have to experience is the transition from Cape or open campus into this degree. Uh, that is why I produced um, in collaboration with the Publications Committee of the Law Society, the Law Society Handbook, How to Law, which you, which you all will be getting in the welcome package this evening. Um, I urge you to read it. We put in a lot of substantive information, such as how to approach legal writing, what is a lecture and what is a tutorial? Because honestly, when I came in, I had no idea what a tutorial was until like we were told that we have to pick tutorials. Um, in addition to this, um, I will be having a live session on Saturday at 1 p.m. Um, details will follow after the session um, concerning the how to law session where we tackle um, adjusting your expectations. What is the etiquette that you have to follow because um, believe it or not, there are certain etiquettes that you have to keep up with when, um, you know, in the classroom or emailing um, lecturers and what the chain of command is that you need to know. Um, in addition, and in addition to that, we also have the peer mentorship program. Um, this is where we've taken year twos and three students and we have trained them and interviewed them. And the process for screening them was very, very thorough, I can assure you, um, to help you. So when you sign up for this program, you're going to be assigned to a mentor and that is your designated person to ask about 
Well, really anything, because their job is to help you navigate through the LLB. So please look out for that. Um, please attend the session and please read the book, because I think it's going to be really, really helpful. Um, and good luck. So uh, that's it for me. OK, thank you very much, Alex, our education uh, committee chairperson. Now to talk a bit more about what you can expect in your Law Society Welcome Package, I just want to throw it over to our secretary, Ms. Ariana Ramnarain. Uh, so Ariana, could you tell us about our Welcome Package? Oh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Heron. Can you just confirm if you can hear me? Yes, seeing and hearing you. Okay, great. Perfect. So welcome again, all students. My name is Ariana Ramnarain. I am the Law Society Secretary for the upcoming academic year. And as Hiran said, I'll just be providing a very brief explanation about what to expect within the welcome package. So the welcome package is traditionally just a compilation of documents prepared by members of the Law Society Executive. And it aims to provide advice, helpful tips, and general bits of guidance to the incoming year ones to assist with the transition into the LLB program. So this year, the administrative officer, Ms. Anita Ali, has graciously agreed to circulate the welcome package to all incoming year ones on behalf of the Law Society. She indicated before that she intends to distribute it via email after the orientation has ended. So thank you again, Mrs. Ali, for all your assistance. That being said, please remember to look out for the email later this evening. Most notably, the email will contain an invite link to the official LLB class of 2024 WhatsApp group chat. Here we'll be sending, by we, I mean the Law Society, we'll be sending frequent updates about Law Society events and we'll try to answer any questions that you may have. So please don't forget to click the link in the email. And moving on to the actual items within the welcome package, the email will contain a link to the Law Society faculty accessible Google Drive, which is linked to a folder entitled the Year One Welcome Package. And within that, there are five PDF documents that, should, that you should look out for. The first being the Law Society Constitution. It is included here as a reference in the event that anyone wants an insight into the membership, composition, and the running of the Law Society. Please note, however, that this version, it is currently being reviewed and the amended version will be made available as soon as possible. Secondly, it would contain a simplified guide to operating Blackboard Collaborate and how to access it through my e-learning, since this is usually the platform that lectures and tutorials are delivered. The third item would be a map of the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus, which some of you may not have ever visited before. It is a really large campus and many of us in my year group in particular struggle to find the law faculty building on our first day. So we thought that this map would be helpful for whenever we return back to physical campus. Fourthly, we would have the Law Society handbook created by Alex. She just spoke to you about it. So I personally recommend that, it, that you read it. It is very helpful and I really wish that I had this handbook when I entered the LLB two years ago. And lastly, Lastly, the, it would contain a directory containing useful and commonly requested contact information for offices and departments within UE. So that would be the bursary, campus registry, registrar, halls of residence, etc. And in the event that you ever need to contact any member of the Law Society Executive, it also contains email addresses, contact information for the members and their respective offices as well. Finally, it also contains telephone numbers and addresses of all gate offices across Trinidad and Tobago a listing of it. So once again, please look out for the email from Ms. Ali later this evening. We tried not to bombard you with too much information. I know it is a lot to take in. So thank you for listening. And I really hope that these documents help make the transition into the LLB just a little less stressful. So all the best for the new semester. And I'll pass you back on to Hiran. Hiran will pass it back over to me. So thank you, Law Society, for that very informative presentation. Uh, uh, so that takes us to the end of the program. I would like to thank everyone for being with us uh, for the last two hours and 14 minutes. Uh, I would like to say a special thanks to our support staff, Miss our administrative officer, Mrs. Kun Kun Ali, and her team, Natasha Richards. We, they worked hard on preparing the program, getting the speakers, and I'm very grateful to them. I would also like to thank all the lecturers for attending and staying with us. 
all of our presenters who have willingly assisted on short notice and presented presentations and they are available, um, their departments to field questions through the relevant service desks. Dr. Balkan? Um, well, you don't have to thank me, but I just wanted to, uh, if I could say something very quickly. Yeah, of course. So, sorry to interrupt you, Timothy, but I, I had to step out of the room and I wasn't sure if you covered this, but, um, and this is, this is in my capacity as a year one lecturer. So I, I'm not sure if um, the students know how to access the classes now that we are online. So I don't know if you covered that while I was gone, but I just want to say to them quickly that there are two platforms you'll have to become familiar with students. One is My Learning, and that's the, the sort of like the course website. You're going to get that for every course you do and you're going to get materials once you're registered you'll get the course materials and that will be the site which will manage your involvement in the course. <clears throat> and then through that or separately, um, we teach over Blackboard Collaborate, BBC, right? Um, so for my class, which begins next week in criminal law, um, you, once you access my learning, you'll get the link to the classroom. You'll see a, right at the very top, you'll see click here for your online tutorial classes, right? Or something like that, you click on it, and you'll enter the room. For those of you who don't have access as yet, don't worry. Um, we'll send <clears throat> emails with the links to the classes. So um, as you were told, the timetable will be circulated. So I see um, the, the admin officers have been very kindly putting in the chat all the time, um, the courses you have to register for. Um, just remember for my course, which is Criminal Law 1, we start on Monday, that's the 6th. So look out for an email for those of you who don't have access to the My Learning platform as yet. Look out for an email and that will have the link that you will click on for your classes. Um, so Timothy, sorry to interrupt you. That's all I wanted to see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Balkan. Uh, so I was at the place of thanking all the speakers, all the lecturers, Law Society, the team at the Division of Student Services and Development, Gerald Alda and his team, Lana Diaram, I'm sure you would have seen her being po posting the survey and they've been actually facilitating the entire session this afternoon. I am grateful and we thank them for their involvement. And I would like to thank most of all you all. I think, um, I know sometimes the conversations may have gotten a little heavy, but I want you all to really celebrate uh, and, and congratulate yourselves for reaching here uh, we just have a few little steps to get beyond and then uh, you'll get into the program. Uh, I really liked what Alexandra said about very practical advice and we will have a session in about two weeks where we will be less formal, more informal. We will chat with you about some of the things that at that point may be a little bit more relevant, how to read cases, how to survive. Uh, I'm seeing Siobhan Carter, Tam asking, when is the how to law session? Again, that would be a law society question. So they actually, you can feel free to email Hiran or the, the team, uh, the law society about any of their, their, their activities. So Alexandra just posted that. So I don't want to drag on the program anymore, anymore but still let everyone know. Thank you all, congratulations. I wish, wish you all the best and we will see you all next week virtually. So please be safe and take care. Bye everyone.